Please welcome Thomas King, founder and chair of Food Frontier, to talk about noise versus reality, the latest landscape data and developments. Thomas King is the founder and chair of Food Frontier. After leading environmental food systems and poverty alleviation initiatives across five continents, Thomas founded Food Frontier in 2017. He is a Maya Innovation Fellow, former Young Australian of the Year, uh, Victoria and current Combank Sustainable Entrepreneur of the Year and his story has been profiled across the ABC, Sydney Morning Herald and The Australian and he has not yet hit 30. So Thomas King, the overachiever, please make him very, very welcome. Thank you, Alice. Um, we're so delighted to have you back for year two. Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome. Uh, we did order some really great weather for you. It seems to not have arrived in time. Apologies, not a great advertisement for Melbourne. Uh, but nonetheless, today's a very exciting day and I, I'm so pleased that you could all join us. We have about 400 here, which is a really tremendous turnout. Um, just to quickly get a sense of who's in the room, a show of hands, who here is already working in the area of alternative proteins in some capacity? Okay. Who is perhaps interested in the field and is using today as an opportunity to explore how you might engage? Okay. Who has no clue what we're talking about or what they're doing here? <laughs> great. I love the honesty. Um, we have a diverse mix, which is great, and I think is, as Alice said about the representation this year uh, compared to last, a sign of how young this space still is. Um, before we dive in, and there's a lot to cover, I'd like us to get existential for a moment. Some of you may know the writer Tim Urban, and I want to build on a thought exercise that he recently uh, set out. The Earth is currently 4.5 billion years old and is expected to be swallowed by the sun in another 5 billion years. That means if 100 million years is one Earth year, Earth is currently 45 and expected to live to 95 years. Humans are Earth's midlife crisis. Plants and animals arrived around Earth's 40th birthday. Before then, life was entirely microbial. Homo sapiens had been around for just one day. The agricultural revolution, where we tamed and manipulated a small selection of species to feed ourselves and grow our communities, happened in the last hour. And the industrial revolution and explosion of our population and technology all occurred in the last minute. In that time, we have managed to develop systems and societies that our ancestors could not have comprehended, including technologies that enhance just about every aspect of our lives, from health to education to food. In that same minute, we have also fundamentally changed Earth's biomass and biosphere, and our food systems have played a big part. 62% of all mammals on Earth are now livestock, a further 34% are humans, just 4% are wild. On land, agriculture now uses almost half of Earth's habitable surface, three quarters of which is grazing and feed production. In our oceans, 90% of fish stocks are now fully exploited or overfished. Since humans took over the house, needless to say, we've had a major impact on the decor. And the footprint of our food systems on both land and sea is quite staggering. At the same time, more people than ever before have access to a diversity of nutrient-rich foods, which is an incredible feat. The question for us now is, how will we nourish eight, soon to be 9.7 billion people while reversing serious ecological and health trends within our lifetimes, i.e. the next few seconds? Because the fate of Earth's future inhabitants depends on it. No pressure. The point is, we're living at a profound moment in history. Remarkable strides have been made and we now find ourselves at a crossroads. I believe the same ingenuity that got us here can rapidly take us to a far more sustainable equilibrium, one where we work with our planet systems, not against them. And innovation in our protein supply is a crucial piece of the puzzle. Food is culture. It's part of the fabric of who we are, our identities, our traditions, our relationships. It brings us comfort and connection and pleasure, and it's our life source. It's what fuels us and it influences the length and the quality of our lives. 
We love familiarity and tradition, yes, but our food choices are also learned and food culture is always changing, more so in today's world than ever before. Many advancements in agri-food systems and products are emerging and nowhere is this more evident than in protein categories, from centre of plate proteins to dairy categories to ready meals. Here and around the world, pioneering startups and suppliers, top retail and food service providers and forward-thinking investors and governments have begun creating together new offerings to meet initial emerging demand from consumers while responding to the need for new proteins alongside traditional ones to sustain us into the future. And they, you, are going about it in various ways. The alternative protein product landscape and technology landscape is becoming increasingly diverse. There are plant-based products ranging from traditional options like tofu and vegetable patties to plant-based meat alternatives, usually with a plant protein isolate or concentrate base and include long-standing and new generation products, to combinations, whether they be blended, say half animal, conventional animal meat, half plant-based or hybrids, which are a mix of different alternative protein inputs, such as plant proteins and products of precision fermentation and cell cultivation. And then there's bio-identical or animal equivalent meat, dairy and egg products produced also using cellular agriculture technologies, which leads us to the tools and tech used to create these foods. Upstream, we have farming and processing sci-tech like crop genetics or molecular farming, where plants can be programmed to grow specific proteins or other compounds, to of course fractionation, the process of taking, say, a legume and separating plant protein from starch and fibre to create those isolates and concentrates, and we need far greater investment in fractionation capacity in this country. Then we have NPD in food manufacturing, from food and nutrition science to high and low moisture extrusion, a mechanical process that forms ingredients into textured plant-based meat and other products. And cell cultivation, also known as cell culturing, a process uh, a multi-stage process of growing and replicating animal cells in a controlled environment. Then there's various forms of fermentation using microorganisms like yeast and other fungi from precision fermentation uh, to produce a particular compound like a fat or a protein to traditional forms of fermentation to improve flavour and uh, function to biomass fermentation to produce a base ingredient or product at scale to a newer innovation called air fermentation, which you'll hear about this afternoon from global pioneer, Dr. Lisa Dyson, who's growing protein from CO2. Uh, now this isn't fully comprehensive, but it gives you a good snapshot. And today we'll touch on just about every one of these areas, even if in a question or two. But for the most part, our predominant focus will be on technologies and products use, utilizing plants, cell cultivation and precision fermentation. Um, the last two often referred to as cellular agriculture, and the sessions uh, in your programs are marked according to those three areas. These fields have evolved rapidly since Food Frontier began just over six years ago. Immense curiosity, excitement, and enthusiasm propelled early investment, the emergence of new plant-based and cellular protein startups, breakthrough innovations, regulatory progress, and an expansion of plant-based options that many consumers tried. But it was early days. Despite subsequent improvements in taste, nutrition, and function, many early products fell short of consumer expectations, and in cellular agriculture, technical and scaling timelines were often underestimated. The last 12 to 18 months has proven most challenging for the space and for many sectors with rising inflation, interest rate hikes, geopolitical tensions, impacting supply chains, production costs, consumer spending, and of course, venture deal flow, which is at multi-year lows across the board. New and emerging fields like this one have been hit hard, and there's a risk of losing valuable talent, ideas, and IP. But no journey of industry diversification or transition is ever truly rapid or frictionless. Emerging industries go through periods of expansion, contraction, and restructure, and that's inevitable and necessary. Will all companies succeed? No. Will we see more mergers and acquisitions? Yes. Is this a sign that the space is going backwards? Not at all. At the outset, this was new, novel, unfamiliar. Now plant-based meat is proven, not only as a viable category with consumer appeal, but as a young, exciting industry with both commercial and community benefits. And we're confident cellular agriculture can follow a similar path. But both will require 
business, government and investors to be working in sync. And today is about exploring the vast untapped opportunities for growth as well as learning from the impressive strides already being made despite the headwinds we often read in headlines. Make no mistake, the growth of alternative proteins has barely begun. By 2030, EY have forecast the global plant-based meat market to reach at least US 57 billion by 2030, with their year uh, end of year estimate for 2023 sitting at 25 billion. As for Australia, many of you will be familiar with Deloitte's forecasts uh, from Food Frontier's original State of the Industry report in 2019, which under a moderate growth scenario projected a $3 billion category by 2030. And that's since been built on by others like FIAL in 2022 and CSIRO with their estimate of the broader plant-based products category in Australia reaching $6 billion by 2030. And this isn't crystal ball gazing. These are well-considered projections informed by sound data and expert modelling and realistic comparisons. So what does the industry landscape look like to date? Let's start with investment. Here we've set out the local and global figures in USD across first half 22, second half 22, and first half 2023 for both plant-based meat and cellular agriculture. Thanks to our friend um, Nicholas Dahl, by the way, from APG for compiling the data that informed these charts. As you can see, globally, investment has declined over the last 18 months from 1.77 billion to almost 600 million, although there's been more decline uh, in deal size than total number of deals, which went from 127 to 93. The ratio of plant-based meat to cell lag has remained relatively similar, but locally, cell lag has received greater investment, and the second half of 22 saw that spike with about uh, 99 million USD, so just over 10% of global funding for that same period. And the biggest disclosed local deals were Vow last November, Nourish last October, and OG last August. And there's been a couple of notable rounds since, including just uh, yesterday, Eden Brews Series A, 25 million was announced, which I'm sure you'll hear about today in Session 6A uh, and or se Session 7, uh, or on our website. And lastly, on cellular agriculture, Cell Agri's data dashboard, which tracks investments globally as far back as 2014, reveals that to date, Australia is actually the fourth top market globally for Cell Ag deal count with 16 disclosed deals and fifth globally for total funding raised at 160 million. Australia also leads the Asia Pacific as a country with the most Cell Ag deals and most funded startups representing 40% of APAC's total investment. However, these are still relatively small numbers considering the industry scale-up requirements. Australia and New Zealand now have 14 cell cellular agriculture startups with a relatively even split across New South Wales, Victoria and Queensland, one in ACT, ranging from companies producing cultivated meat to precision fermentation dairy products to those specialising in inputs like cells or recombinant proteins. There are four companies processing or supplying plant protein ingredients domestically, three in Victoria, one in WA, and 26 plant-based meat manufacturers, from small startups to family-run meat and butchery businesses uh, to SMEs and larger players, with 11 based in New South Wales, six in Victoria, three in Queensland, five in New Zealand, and one in South Australia. All up, Australia and New Zealand now have 44 companies in the space, up from just four in 2017. This map uh, will be made, made available on our website for download tomorrow and the full downloadable directory with more details on these companies is already on there. Um, if anybody here represents a company that's headquartered and or manufacturing domestically uh, that's missing from this map or that needs updating, please reach out. In ma major retail in Australia, the plant-based meat category has gone from fewer than five brands made by Australian and New Zealand businesses in 2017 to now more than 30. And there's been a threefold increase in the number of products on shelves over the last few years from less than 90 to about 300. Our research shows it's actually peaked at 350 in January um, and we've seen some consolidation since then, which again is not unexpected. Australian New Zealand brands now make up two thirds of products in major retail and the international brands that trailblazed the category uh, in earlier days still have a strong presence such as Beyond, Impossible and Fries. Continued investment in NPD and advancements in ingredient formulations and manufacturing capabilities has seen an increase in variety of formats and flavours. Here is our latest data showing prominence of uh, 
format types in retail from left to right, as well as the growth within each format. The light bar representing uh, July 2020, the darker bar being last month. Many of the first products uh, were burgers in 2018-19, so it's no surprise there's been 0% increase in the total number on shelves since. We've seen a 254% increase in ready meal options, although this was actually even higher in late 2022. With consumers looking for convenience, we've seen an increased supply of formats like meatballs, deli slices, and snacking and finger foods. Similarly, consumer interest in products that can incorporate into a variety of dishes has seen more versatile and functional formats hit shelves like beef style trip, uh, strips and chunks to whole style cuts, although there's still fewer than 10 of each in market. And when we say consumers, yes, as vegetarians and vegans who make up sort of up to 10% of the population, but the bigger focus has been on flexitarians and meat reducers uh, who make up a further 25%. And these folks are seeking to eat plant-based at more meal occasions, uh, but are still wanting familiar tastes, formats, and convenience. For an even more comprehensive snapshot of the industry, including updated projections to 2020, 2033, by Deloitte, state-by-state -state jobs breakdowns, price trends, and retail and food service sales. Keep an eye out for our next State of the Industry report, which is due in Q1 next year. Um, our previous two versions continue to inform media stories, investment decisions, industry funding applications, government policy, corporate strategy, and like our previous two, this next report will set out clear recommendations, uh, illuminating how best to maximise opportunities for growth. For now, uh, I'd like to share a few overarching ideas for how this could be achieved. Firstly, no single company, investor, research group or government is going to solve this. A huge level of genuine collaboration is required and a collective impact mindset from ecosystem-wide coordination to one plus one equals three partnerships will yield greater results for all involved. The idea that every cell ag company can successfully develop into end production or that every plant-based business can own and run a profitable facility is simply unrealistic. Rapid innovation often comes by climbing on the shoulders of others. Mergers, acquisitions and partnerships are a sign of a maturing market and it is much easier to accelerate growth by using the proven capability of others, whether IP, infrastructure or distribution networks. The crucial KPI for all new businesses is speed to value, and we're seeing healthy signs of such collaborations, and that's driving further growth and unlocking solutions across product quality, ingredient availability, production efficiencies, cost, even shaping consumer sentiment. And these will be enabled only through increased funding across venture capital, industry, banks, government, even philanthropy, and more co-investments and coordination like initiatives such as the Alternative Protein CRC and the Alternative Proteins Council. Second, consumers. From seeds and cells to supermarket shelves, <laughs> tongue twister, vast opportunities exist across the value chain to uh, improve taste, texture and performance through R&D. Things that most consumers simply will not compromise and the consumer must remain the priority. The advancements in plant-based products in recent years are clear, but still there's much further progress that can be achieved by innovating in crop optimization to ingredients, to product formulation, to manufacturing. As our data shows on formats, some like burgers are arguably over-serviced, over other categories have far fewer offerings. And could there be more options that don't set out to exactly replicate the experience of animal products? There's scope to both improve existing offerings and create completely new ones. The best of plant-based meat, however, is truly delicious and delightful, and I'm looking forward to experiencing some great examples of that throughout today. Next is government. Only with proactive government support can the forecast set out earlier be achieved. In fact, a report commissioned by the UK's foreign Commonwealth and Development Office found that global public spending on alt protein R&D and commercialization would need to increase to at least 10.1 billion USD annually, and we are far from that. Policymakers have a fundamental role in enabling development of new innovation and industry that benefits businesses and communities, and alt proteins is an excellent example. With the changing climate and growing global protein demand, 
Policymakers need to look at food security as a wicked challenge and one that Australia and New Zealand are perfectly positioned to further address by investing in even more resilient, productive and profitable food systems. From helping unlock the potential of our scientists and attract more talent into the space to de-risking the scale-up of critical infrastructure for new supply chains to attract, attracting greater inbound investment and increasing our international attractiveness and competitiveness, state and federal governments are presented with many under-leveraged opportunities to foster and accelerate new old protein IP, job and business creation. Now is the time for governments to step forward with greater funding, incentives, partnerships and enabling policies, or we risk losing out to other regions. Alongside government funding is a need for continued private sector investment, which as we saw has dropped this year within the current economic climate. More investors are needed, investors who are patient and practical, who understand the timelines involved in scaling new food and biotechnologies. A field like cellular agriculture presents immense potential, but it's not without its uh, you know, complexity, scale up and regulatory hurdles and public education requirements, all of which require considerable time and resource, like any game changing innovation. Not all companies will succeed, but at the same time, the field has some excellent talent and IP, which let's be clear, we will begin to lose to other markets unless both public and private support increases. And as CAPEX requirements increase, larger financial institutions also have a greater role in enabling the scale up of these new forms of food technology. Number five, simple and consistent narrative building will go a long way. Food choices are driven by emotion, not logic, and no one wants to eat a perceived science experiment. Many of us might view alt proteins as technology, but to the consumer, it's food, meaning Messaging and marketing needs to inform by social researchers, creatives, food culture influencers and leaders in gastronomy to help educate, excite and delight. Efforts have been underway to bring greater consistency to terminology in both plant-based and cell egg, which is great, as are the very early discussions in plant-based about the potential for collaborative, ecosystem-wide, category-wide marketing initiatives to drive education and trial and repeat purchase. And finally, we know from initial research that on average, current plant-based meat offerings provide a number of nutritional and environmental benefits and that health is also the top motivator for many flexitarians. Yet there are still areas for exploration and improvement. New research, formulations, manufacturing tech and culinary innovation presents opportunity to further reduce ingredient lists, degrees of processing, enhance nutrition, while enabling things like better carbon measurement and more sustainable packaging and cellular agriculture has a similar scope for continued health and environmental focus. That all requires further research as well as clear, uh, consistent data-driven messaging, both of which are key focuses at Food Frontier along with other areas listed here. So as you can see, there's no shortage of things to do um, and no matter where you sit in the ecosystem from science to sales, everybody has a crucial role in driving smarter strategies, greater investment and partnerships, and the settings to enable these new industries to scale and flourish. As NextGen Foods co-founder and CEO, Andre Meniz says, we need as an industry to stop thinking that one isolated factor, be it a magic molecule, price, infrastructure, technology, or policies, will drive the change individually. In other words, it's a convergence of technological, economic, political, and cultural shifts driven by compelling imperatives and opportunities that will advance new markets for alternative proteins. And we'll be unpacking many of these areas throughout today with 40 exceptional speakers across industry science, research, marketing, policy, and investment. So what role do we play at Food Frontier other than convening uh, the annual conference? As the region's independent think tank on alternative proteins, we are bringing about a more diverse and sustainable protein supply by uh, advancing dialogue and decision making. And we do this through a number of areas. Our research reports, our events, and direct engagements with businesses, policymakers, and innovators, all of which is helping catalyze, inform, and facilitate positive progress in the space. To date, our research and insights have reached 76 million people in the media. 22,000 at events, 17,000 via direct report downloads, and we've held 1,100 stakeholder meetings and facilitated over 300 introductions. 
Key initiatives include our industry roundtables, webinars, input into government consultations, our reports, spanning industry analysis, exports, consumer insights, health and nutrition, investment opportunities, the list goes on. And this work is led by our uh, excellent team, who we'll bring up next, uh, including our executive director, Dr. Simon Isom, who should be in the room. Simon, give us a wave. Simon's up the back there. Simon's going to be emceeing our other uh, stream when we break out into two groups. And we also have Susie, our industry lead, Meg on policy, Clara on research, Kathy on communications. If you could just stand up or give us a wave to make yourselves known. Our team will be around all day, so please go and introduce yourselves to them. I'd also like to acknowledge some of Food Frontier's incredible directors here today, Dr. Anne Aston and David Booker. And as for me, I'm now part-time as founder and chair, focusing on uh, less, less on projects, more on strategy, governance, and fundraising. Speaking of, uh, it would be remiss of me not to thank the generous individuals and foundations who make Food Frontier's work possible, um, some of whom are here today, and to acknowledge our NGO partners, many of whom are also in the room. There are various ways you can engage with us and our work beyond our events, whether it be our, our partnerships and collaborations on specific initiatives, engaging one of our experts for an interview or presentation, accessing our data and insights, which are freely available online, uh, asking for guidance or introductions, and of course, subscribing to our newsletter. Or even by, by donating. Food Frontier is a not-for-profit uh, with tax deductibility status, which allows us to maintain our independence and focus wherever we can have greatest impact. And impact is why we exist. Because while our current food and protein production and consumption is linked to issues ranging from non-communicable diseases to div uh, biodiversity loss to future pandemic risk, this also means food is the solution. And this is especially true for our climate. Experts have warned that even if fossil fuel emissions were to cease immediately, global food system emissions could preclude us from uh, limiting global warming to the 1.5 and possibly 2 degree upper limits. At the same time, our already changing food system will wreak increasing havoc for food production, global supply chains and food security. Rapid transformation is needed to slow rates of warming while protecting food security and innovation in our protein supply is crucial to this. From genuine improvements in traditional animal protein production to new options with an inherently small footprint. Both are needed and we must work together. As CSIRO state in their protein roadmap for Australia, demand for protein is large and growing and can only be met for a combination of animal proteins, plant proteins and novel production systems. As progress is made in traditional systems, scaling new ones that utilise plants, cell biology and microbes is essential to sustain us into the future. And finally on this, just last year, um, Boston Consulting Group found that dollar for dollar investing in improving and scaling meat alternatives drives more emissions reduction than other interventions, including 11 times more than zero emission cars. They calculated that if alternative proteins reached a predicted 11% global market share by 2030, it would be equal to decarbonising 95% of the aviation industry in the same time. And 10 to 11% share is not an unrealistic goal. The challenge is not making this happen, it is happening. It's a question of how quickly we can get there and which companies and markets will lead the world. Australia and New Zealand are exceptionally well placed to compete in this fast growing global sector, should we wish to. By harnessing fully our R&D production and export capabilities, we can become a global epicenter for the development and supply of new protein tech ingredients and finished products alongside our existing ones. Now's the time to double down and grasp the opportunity before us. We started small, we thought big, we failed fast, now we must scale even faster. Just imagine a world where you step into any supermarket and across the store is a diversity of protein rich, nutritious, sustainable and satisfying options from familiar tastes to new experiences at accessible price points. And you sit down at any restaurant and a third of the mains menu features those same types of foods. This is a world where consumers win, farmers can win, nature wins 
and so do future generations. It protects the ecological systems we rely on to survive while providing greater economic and food security for communities across our region and beyond. And it's not out of reach. Yes, this will take many years. The steeper portion of growth within the S-curve of adoption comes with generational shifts. However, we have the tools today to accelerate this progress. So how do we supercharge scalability, bring down cost, improve taste, inspire consumers and ultimately compress that adoption curve? That is what we are here to figure out today. So please don't shy away from the big questions and the bold ideas. Let this event be a critical moment to spark conversation and collaboration to usher in a new food future. And let's hope that the planet's 45th birthday celebration will see receipt of a gift guaranteeing a next prosperous next 45 years. Thank you so much. <laughs>